my skill as a medical intuitive was probably a natural extension of, of my whole life. I mean, I was educated by nuns and priests and uh, until I was 29, for God's sake. How many people could say that and survive? Anyway, I, uh, and in the world I came from, the, and the, the spiritual side of life was so ordinary, so ordinary, that um, the extraordinary became ordinary. I simply became uh, very attuned, very, um, yeah, very attuned, very conscious, if you will, of the way people were feeling and of, uh, that I was picking up more than just the average highs or lows that you might pick up from a friend. I mean, you might uh, say, you know, I, I think there was something wrong with Ginny today or whatever. But in my case, I was able to say, yeah, there's something wrong with Ginny. Her, her, uh, she's developing a bladder infection. But all of a sudden I thought, I, I can't even tell you how normal that was. I didn't sit around and say, how did I know that? What happened to me was I said, oh, that's why I've had this energy in me. It's taking this focus. Carolyn Mace is one of the world's most renowned medical intuitives. She uses a form of second sight to perceive illnesses and their hidden causes. Through thousands of intuitive medical readings, Carolyn discovered that in addition to our physical anatomy, each of us also possesses an energy anatomy, a system of interconnected energy centers, invisible to the eye, but critical to the formation of disease and the process of healing. And now, Carolyn Mace. Thank you. Thank you all for being here. And applaud you too. Thank you all for being here. Uh, through the years, I've changed a great deal as a teacher, I think most teachers do. And the reason I have is because my work and my research has taken me down a different path. I used to, um, my work used to be uh, medical intuitive readings on people. And what happened was this incident. And what I would do is I would do these workshops where I would have 60 or 70 people and I would do a reading on every single person in that workshop. I would leave there in a bucket of sweat, but everybody got their reading. And uh, one day I was doing a workshop, and I sat next to this woman, and I said, so what can I do for you? And she sat there like this, and she looked at me and said, I don't know. I paid my money. You tell me. <laughs> okay, so being the calm person I am, I looked at her and said, you and I are going to sit here until I figure out some gracious way to deal with that remark. And this may take us a few years, so have your dinner sent in. <laughs> All right, but what I realized in that moment was that I really didn't help people all that much by doing readings. But that the better way for me to serve people would be by teaching you how to evaluate your own energy, how to recognize when your energy was leaving your body and what the significance of that is, how to recognize when some kind of energy was entering your body, how to know in that instant moment that, whoops, I'm having a power leak and spot the target that it's leading to. And then what to do about it. I mean, it's not good enough to say I'm screaming in the middle of the street. I'm leaking. I'm leaking. <laughs> you know, that's not going to help you. All right. But what do you do about that once that starts? And how to unplug your energy? So I hope that you'll join me today and as I teach you the skills I've learned, as I, as I present to you the human energy system as I've learned to work with it. It's the best tool I have to give you. So the next thing people are usually interested in is how did I become a medical intuitive? <laughs> you know, I'm very boring in this category of my story. I wish I had a story to tell you like I had an apparition or, you know, I had some kind of unusual encounter with an ET, but that's not the truth. The truth is it was the most natural evolution in my own life. I studied theology. I was, 
I was educated by nunsies. I love nunsies. And, uh, you know, for nuns, the extraordinary is the ordinary. Okay? I mean, that's just the way it is. And so I had uh, that kind of background. And so when I began to have uh, the insight that I, I was uh, intuitive and that it was taking the focus as a medical intuitive, meaning that the kind of data I received from people was the information that told me about where they were losing their spirit, their energy, to issues in their life that resulted consequently in the breakdown of their body. That's what I learned and, uh, I learned and how to work with that. Then I knew uh, I had a very upsetting moment because most people will report or share with you that when they emerge into their intuitive abilities, it scared them. That's not what scared me. No, no, no. Because of my background around the nuns, what scared me is that I knew that when people had this kind of ability, they were generally shuffled off to the monastery. That's what scared me. I didn't like the thought of where the rest of my life could lead me, but fortunately, for me, it didn't go that direction. So, let's get into this. Your human body, your energy body, the way I like to teach it is in terms of giving you the model that you have circuits coming in through the top of your head. And we probably do, okay? And as the circuits come into your head, it of course fills your entire body, helps in the development of cells, helps in the maintenance of your life. And what, what I really believe that if I, if we could imagine that I was your angel coach and you hadn't yet incarnated, and I'm going to tell you what lo life on the planet Earth is about. <laughs> I wonder if we could find the angelic Prozac. But anyway, <laughs> what I would tell you is as you prepare for incarnation, what is the th what is the purpose? Why are you going down there? This is the reason. You're going down to learn the wise distribution of this energy. Because as you plug your energy into anything, what you give that energy to becomes an investment in the process of life. And that investment gives returns to you and returns to the whole of life. Think of it like investing money. And that every day you're given $100 worth of energy to spend in your life. And that as you invest it, either you're going to invest it in positive circumstances, positive relationships, positive thoughts that will bring high interest returns to your system, or you're going to make investments in which you start building a debt. And eventually the $100 worth of energy that you have every day is not going to be enough to finance your debts. You've got to take a loan. Where are you going to get that loan? You're going to get it from your cell tissue or you're going to get it from other people's energy. You develop a kind of a parasitical sense where you need to be around people's energy in a way that's beyond even your consciousness. You don't know why you need this person. You don't know why you need this addiction. But it comes from the fact that you're literally grasping for energy because you're running out. And then at some point, that actually becomes the formation of an illness. So I want you to keep this in your mind. And I also want to point out, uh, as you uh, as I continue with this, and think of your own energy circuits, because as I dis discuss and list the many ways you can lose your energy, you know, take note, and don't sit there and say, oh, that's not me. Of course, I would do that, but I don't want you to do that. <laughs> okay. What's it look like when your energy leaks? Look at this image. You have energy coming into the top of your head, and when I d did a reading on somebody, when I still do them, I use this image. I, am, I literally use like a timeline that goes back to the sense of your birth. And then what, I get a sense of where you're leaking energy and why. One of the favorite, pe you know, one of the favorite places people like to le leak their energy is into their childhood. That's very popular. So you send your energy back to uh, years ago, years and years ago. Uh, in, into some degree of parental criticism and what you decide unconsciously, and this is true, is what percentage of your energy goes in that direction. Now I'm going to tell you something. This is absolutely real. And once you start noticing this in yourself, you're going to see, you're really going to be surprised. When you get up in the morning and you run off to the shower and you're showering and you're dressing, I'm telling you something. While you're doing that, you are going through an energy distribution phase. 
and you're preparing for that day. And if you're holding on to a lot of this historic part of yourself, you are literally taking your hundred dollars worth of energy and saying, okay, give 20 bucks to my childhood, give 30 bucks to the end of that relationship, give 115 bucks to the way I left my last job. So by the time you're done, what do you, what do you have left is either you're in debt or my handwriting is much better in different circumstances. Either you're in debt or you, and you've begun the borrowing of energy from your uh, physical tissue or you're left with somewhere between 20 to uh, two bucks to run your life today, today. And I, I want to point out what that, this means in actually practical terms. Just imagine that you have a marvelous thought, a marvelous thought, an inspiration. Like, here's your angel saying, listen to me. It's time for you to leave here and start a marvelous new creative job. Imagine that. And you hear the inspiration because hearing does not cause, it does not require a lot of energy. What requires the energy is action. So you take this inspiration and you think, oh, this is good. And then your angel is sitting next to you and saying, look, toots, do you really want this idea to become a powerful part of your life? Then you better get some of the energy from your past because this is going to cost energy. I need $80 worth of your energy per day to make this incarnate. And if you're running into high debt, the only thing you'll ever do with that energy, the only thing you'll ever do with that thought, is wish you could do something with it and then regret that you never did. Oh, I, I'd like you to work as I uh, talk about um, your energy system today. I'd like you to have the same definition of healing in mind and you could sort of fill in the blanks at your leisure. Somewhere. But healing is the process of returning these energy circuits into your body. You can call that recalling your spirit, put it in any language you want, but essentially what you're doing is you're unplugging your, your precious gift of energy and you're returning it back into your body. Have you ever truly forgiven anybody? It's not a pleasant thing to do, but I mean, it is a necessity. Or have you ever finally let go of something? What happens is you actually feel unbelievably ecstatic. You feel like this, wow, I feel light. How many times have you said it or heard someone say, I just feel so light after that experience? You're not, you are actually not kidding yourself. You are lighter. This makes you lighter. It makes you more, vib literally brings energy into your system. You are lighter. That's not just a sweet phrase we've created. This is the real thing. I had a real interesting history with the idea of healing. You know, I, I started getting involved with um, people and, and what made people ill around 1983, something like that. And during that time, because we were so influenced by the thought that we create our own reality, people would come to the, my workshops and they would absolutely be filled almost with a pride that they had recognized that they created their own reality and therefore they created this illness. And that somehow through the, through the ritual of standing up and saying, I know I'm responsible for this, and I have you know, cancer or I have whatever illness, that by taking res that responsibility meant, uh, meant sort of proclaiming the punitive end of it. And at the same time, the holistic end was giving us the information that if you had the right herbs and you ate tofu and you stood on your head and you, you did these things, that you were going to heal. It was inevitable. 1988 rolls around and no matter what country I was in, it was phenomenal. The audience had shifted. It was more of this attitude. Okay, I've tried, look at this list, acupuncture, herbs, yoga, everything. By the way, I love all those things, but we have to talk about what it means to be in present time in order for these energetic tools to take flight, okay? You can't have your energy living in your life mausoleum and expect these energy tools to do their job. So what I realized is we should be healing a little bit more. And so now people were wondering, why am I not healing? So I started to look at that question. And I realized 
that we're scared, pun intended, to death of healing. It's as frightening to us, it's about as frightening as forgiveness, if not the same. And the reason is because healing, this is, these are the reasons. Number one, we've learned to use healing in a really socially, in a real socially powerful way. We form wound mates with healing. We do this. You know, you meet somebody in here, you go through the basic questions. Where are you from? I'm from Chicago. I'm from Los Angeles. So what do you do? You follow the chakras. It'll go just in the order. Here, first chakra, you're, you're, you're where you're born. Then you go up to the second, which is, so what do you do for a living? Well, so you say, I paint houses and I paint, uh, I, and I paint pictures. Isn't that interesting? Got that in common. Then you go up to the third chakra, which is now a little more personal, but not real personal. Here's the question. Are you a vegetarian? Oh, no, I do this. Okay, so now you know all you need to know about someone here, but that's no longer bonding. It used to be the way we bonded, not anymore. Now, if you really want to bond with someone, you've got to share a wound. But you get, now be careful about this, because you don't want to overwhelm them with all your wounds. You've got to get a woundette, okay? <laughs> so what you do is you pull out a small wound. You say something like, you know, when I was a child, I never got any donuts from my mother. Now, if you want to bond with that person, what you do is you look at, you look them straight in the eye and you keep your thinking on donuts. I gotta find a donut sized wound and you send your consciousness down to your first chakra file. You know, give me a donut, quick, quick, quick. And you come back up and you say, you never got donuts? I never got cupcakes. <laughs> and right after that, the bond's established. And what's so fascinating is there's an archetypal union that takes place. Without you saying anything or, or the other person saying anything, you already understand that these are the rules. If I call you up and I say to you, I am having a donut flashback, you know automatically that you have to drop whatever you're doing and run and support me. Why, I ask you, would I want to give up that kind of security if that's what healing was all about? I mean, I took a real good look at this, and I, I want to share these perceptions with you and all the others that I've gained in, this, um, in my years working as a medical intuitive and working in these groups. And I hope that this information will become a tool for you that you can take from here and from now on use for the rest of your life so that you can become very conscious of when you're losing power, to whom you're losing power, or to what, how much power you're putting into an attitude. I mean, I, I had the experience the other day where someone came up to me and said that she had had a reading by someone, and this person told her that this woman was a, is a detective, and that this person told her that this job was dangerous for her because she saw her getting shot. Now, as I, and I talked to her and I said, are you gonna finance that idea or not? Now, if, you, if we really knew what it was to develop high-voltage willpower, we'd actually have the quality of will that says, as you feel your circuit leaving your body and breathing its prana into this thought, okay? And I want you to think of thoughts like a, a flat balloon that you literally blow up, that it attached to your energy. You could look at your circuit of energy and say, get back here and leave that alone. But now, we, our willpower is at the stage in our evolution, not for everybody, but for most of us, where we have become so, un, we're so unaccustomed to really developing will that when your energy leaves your body and you say, you get back here, your energy circuits turn around, say, you talking to me? Because I'm on my own, you know? And so that's what makes healing so difficult. That's what makes the return of health so difficult because we need a lot of focus. We need a lot of consciousness to begin to say to your energy circuits, I said, get back here. You've been out long enough. I want you home for dinner. Let me introduce the chakra system to you. The chakra system is the way that the Eastern traditions have expressed the energy or illustrated the energy through the human body. According to the Hindu tradition, we have seven, what they would describe as wheels in our energy field. I use the term data bank. I do this because the way I work with this, these centers is that for me, each one 
and I'll explain this to you as I go further and further through this workshop, but each one contains a certain type of information very specific to areas of our own spiritual maturation. We go, we mature through, um, think of it as stages of power, and those stages of power complete, are completely aligned to the seven chakras. Furthermore, I think, you know, when you think of physical anatomy, it's an incredibly well-defined um, science. Every single cell has some kind of effect on the whole. Our energetic anatomy system is exactly as specific as is our physical anatomy. So much so that in a reading, I've, I've long ago discovered that there are very, very specific patterns to the illnesses that we develop. If we're losing power, if we, for example, develop an illness in our pancreas, a pancreatic disorder from diabetes to pancreatic cancer, this is tracked to issues of the third chakra that deal with responsibility. When people, and now this is responsibility in the extreme, when someone is struggling with feeling that they're responsible for everybody, or the opposite, where they want no responsibility for their lives. The organ in your body that gets stressed the most is your pancreas. Now I can go through almost every organ and show you what uh, chakra center they relate to, but there will be a direct relationship, okay? And the other thing I want to add at this point is your tendency as I proceed with the rest of the information is to think if you have a heart illness that it's simply and always located in the fourth chakra. It must be something in the fourth chakra. That's not the way you read these centers. You read them as an entire group. And what I've realized is that most illness develops from an energy loss below your waist even a heart disorder. And the reason why it locates in your heart has to be merged with whatever level of physical stress is working with your body at the lower level. For example, you may have a relationship that had just caused you a lot of stress in your life, indeed a heartache. So now you have the combination of your second chakra working with your fourth. And depending upon how that stress works out, that will depend on what organ of the body it will locate itself in, but I can fairly well assure you that it will either choose the heart to, uh, to influence or the blood, which is of course through the heart, or some organ in the second chakra, um, the colon, the sexual uh, organs, the lower back. But this is how that works together. You have to read this as a whole system and not just lock into one chakra and make the assumption that if I have um, a chronic sore throat, it's only and solely a fifth chakra issue. That is not so. So as we go through the rest of the chakras in this workshop, I want you to think that you are learning a whole system that you have to read with fluency rather than one at a time, okay? And then there is the point that I want to bring, that, uh, bring into the um, illustrate to you, and that's that as energy comes in through the top of your head and you make these, um, shall we say, investments of energy from your chakras into various parts of your life, you make investments that then come back into your body in the form of what we could call returns on your investments. Every single investment carries a return. So that I want you to think, image your body as going out into areas of your life. What kind? You have relationships, you have your environment, you have here. You can make an investment of 90% of your energy in something you want, a piece of jewelry. A house. I mean, I've seen people lose their health because they want a certain house. Can you imagine that? I mean, maybe it's just me, but I can't imagine that. But anyway, and whatever you invest in has to return. It think of it this way. It simply has to return more than you invested. You've got to earn interest on your investments. That's the way you think from now on. You've got to earn interest on it. If, you ca if it doesn't pay back to you a positive interest, why would you invest? 
From now on, just think of yourself as an energetic banker. Why would you invest? And the consequence is if your investment gets you into debt, you've got to take out a loan. You can either borrow from another person's energy system, which I can promise you is going to blow that friendship right out of the water, or you're going to take a loan from your cell tissues. And you're going to borrow, borrow on energy that's been stored in your body in the cell tissue and will start pulling it out. I don't know if you've ever seen anybody who's had the experience of almost aging overnight. Have you ever seen that? where someone has had such a stressful experience that within three or four months, they've aged three or four years. Well, that's exactly what I'm talking about. They've had, to, they've had so many experiences that have cost them at the max, shall we say, of their energy system, that they're taking out fast loans from their body. And their body, consequently, and I want you to take this literally, ages faster. The more energy you keep in present time, the slower you age. The more energy you make in bad investments that return, um, that, that call for, that get you into, shall we say, energetic debt, the faster you age. And it, think of how logical that is. It drains, what if you start pulling the energy out of your cell tissue, your face, it's going to start sagging. Your body will start feeling fatigued. You don't have the same energy to keep the life force in you in the same way. Just use logic. Think, use the metaphor, the analogy, rather, that you are a banker, and that's all there's to it. And from now on, once, even, even if the thought, even if someone offers you a thought, a thought to invest in, here, just a thought to invest in. Here's a good thought. Um, Here's a typical thought like, don't you think the world is going to end as soon as we cross over the year 2000? Or some such popular thought in the marketplace these days. Now you have the option, am I going to finance that thought or am I not? You have choice. And you decide, I'm, I will not contribute one circuit of my energy into that thought. First of all, you've done the world a great service. But secondly, you've done yourself one as well, because you're not plugging your own energy system into a thought that can only bring back to you negativity and eventually cost you energy because it's not supplying, paying off the energy that you've loaned to that thought. Your first chakra is your tribal belief center. This is, remember that the image of when we are born, we have a hundred circuits coming into our head. Now, we're not conscious enough to invest these circuits, so our tribe, our family, our biological family does it for us. And it, the family invests your belief, beliefs into what they believe as a group or as a tribe. So if, you're, if your uh, family is of a certain religion, they'll take a number of your circuits and invest that into their particular religious beliefs. If your, every, everybody's family does this, they'll invest a part of your circuits into um, your ethnic heritage and what you should feel about that. They'll invest, and even down to if the um, ethnic group that you're, that you're a part of has a sense of uh, lower self-esteem or higher self-esteem. I mean, I, I remember someone saying to me in London one time, I tell you, people are a hoot. This woman said, you know, I suppose there might be other nationalities. One might want to be other than British, but you know, I can't think of what they might be. <laughs> now, I'm looking at her, and I said, I can think of one, but anyway. And we engaged in tribal warfare, okay? I mean, it was as simple as that, but mine, of course, was more enlightened. All right, now, <laughs> and here, you also have, you know, as I said, ethnic, you have prejudice. You have attitudes that you absorb from society. For example, how many of you hold on to the notion that's very popular in this tribe that it's better to be thin than not thin? Everybody, hands up, come on, all of you. How many of you 
Okay, here's the thin is in school of charm, okay? All right. Now, here's the young is better than old. Anybody? Okay. These are all tribal beliefs, and here's one of my favorites, is the tribal superstitions you inherit. All right, this is so much fun. So many people will say, I'll ask them, okay, what kind of tribal superstitions do you have? And they'll, they'll give me superstitions that they say they have nothing to do with. Like someone will say to me, you know, walking under a ladder, I said, are you connected to that? Absolutely not. And I want to say to them, walk under those ladders, all 17 of them, you know, and they won't do it, right? We're connected to unbelievable family. I'll tell you one story that comes to mind. With this wonderful psychologist I knew in Chicago, and she was a Puerto Rican. And for her, for her family, the fact that she'd made it all the way through uh, to a PhD in psychology made this family so proud of her. And she was such a gracious person. But, they, but in her culture, they have a belief in the, the, the um, evil eye or the, the, this kind of thing. And so one, there was a woman who apparently had this reputation of being that kind of a, what we would call perhaps a witch in, in, uh, different, in a different culture. And she was walking home one day, this, this psychologist was walking home, and she spots this other woman looking at her through the curtain, like this kind of direction. And she came home convinced that the evil eye had been put on her, right? And it went right down into her first chakra. She div and your first chakra, by the way, if converted into illness, is the center of you. This runs your immune system, okay? Your immune system is your protective field, okay? So this is your immune system. So what, what happened was she literally leaked her energy completely to this experience with this woman from that moment on every single one of her circuits came in and out in the blink of an eye instantly her immune system took a nosedive all right and no matter i'm going to show you how important this is no matter how much you try to reason with a person she was put under a spell you want the medieval word for it she was put under a spell the area below your waist cannot be reasoned with it's not possible you can look down there as much as you want and you are not speaking the same language, all right? So no matter how much you talked with her through the in intellectual field and say, come on, that woman's just a crazy old crow sitting in a window. Her mind can say, uh-huh, crazy old crow. All you, she understands are the words. That's it. But nothing has more voltage than the fear. Be and, and one other thing you've got to keep in mind, when you're holding on to a tribal fear, you are not alone. Imagine if all of us in this room were in one tribe, okay, was part of one tribe. Now, that means that for every tribal belief I had, all of your energy is running through me simultaneously. So if we all believed in, in um, our religion was better than anybody else's, we would be sharing that belief together, we would be evolving at the speed of that belief together. And first chakra is your slowest speed. And if someone started to talk to me about changing my religion or challenging it, instantly I would alert you on the energetic plane to come to my assistance. Instantly. And all of us, and you, I could be sitting there having an iced tea or whatever, gabi gabi, doing something like that. Not even here, but a part of my first chakra would engage contact with yours, and off and running would be my energy to help you out. Now, let me make a suggestion just for the fun of it. As I go through all of these, and you, why don't you take notes if it would help you? Write down your associations. Write down areas where you think you might be losing power. So, let me move on here and show you the positive side of the first chakra, the tribal chakra, because you want to know that there is a positive and a, a, a negative, shall we say, a shadow side of every single chakra, and it's just as important to know one as it is the other. The tribal, from the tribal energy, you also get a connection from nature. This is how you connect to groundedness. 
This is your rapport with nature, with the earth, with a center that the, with a sense that the earth is running through you and you through it. This is a very powerful part of the first chakra. Another a aspect that's so incredibly um, gripping is that the first chakra is your, is your center of community, how, how you need others, where you fit into a community. And so it teaches you loyalty, the meaning of loyalty, what it means to have a bond with people. Now, I want to tell you that this is at this point that you should not think of this just in terms of your biological family, not at all. These characteristics apply as much to a street gang as they do to the tribe that you work with. And just like a street gang or any tribe you work with, you have to go through an initiation to get in to see if you'll be loyal. And what is loyalty? Loyalty means they're finding out at an unconscious level how many of your circuits you're willing to commit to their cause. That's what initiation is all about which is why there is such a difficult sometimes challenge to initiation. I mean, I don't know if you saw that one um, news story. I don't, it was last year sometime, or maybe this year. I, it was this year, about the marine initiation, where they take this hideous object and put it in these, the chest of these men and then punch on it for a half hour, and if they survive this, they're a marine. Come on. Anyway, but it's a show of loyalty. It's a show of loyalty. Now. I, and you know, I want to point something else out about that, which is this. The tribe, the purpose of the tribe is survival, physical survival. The tribe is responsible for teaching you how to live with your feet and your legs straight on the earth so you can stand up for yourself. So it's meant to teach you social skills, so how you work well with people within your community as well as teaching you a sense of um, what it means to act with honor among others. So often people comment to me that they had an unloving biological tribe. But what I've realized is the, po the purpose of the tribe in a very positive way is almost to emphasize loyalty more than love. It's loyalty as love and loyalty as a form of love, which is why we speak about um, family being literally and more uh, metaphorically in our blood. The vibration is literally in our blood. There's many, many, many positive aspects to this. You have a sense of pride in your history and in who your, what your family traditions are and a sense of respecting those traditions, sharing them with others. And it also is true that uh, this first chakra is very much, uh, totally thrives within a stable family. Because the fact is we really are tribal creatures by design. While we might need our days or weeks or months alone, we also need to have some kind of contact with the community. If we're mystics, we need a mystic vacation with other mystics. You know, that's what's true. We have to be part of the community, no matter how we define that, because we thrive off of that. And because the nature of community energy is such that you really want to feel yourself plugged into others. You know, one of the reasons the Mormon faith has thrived so much is uh, not really so much based on the beliefs of the Mormon tradition, which of course they respect, and I do as well, but it's also the social structure that they provide for others. People within the Mormon faith know that if their lives fall apart, they have, boom, instant support in the blink of an eye. It's a phenomenal connection. So you ask yourself, how does this first chakra apply to me? What questions should I ask myself to find out if I'm leaking any energy, ask yourself if you have any um, connection to your family, your biological family now, that is negative and that you fuel every day. Ask yourself. No, nobody, huh? <laughs> All right. And how much of your energy, how much of that memory do you finance every day? Ask yourself 
if there are belief patterns from your family that you really want to get rid of and you simply can't. I'll give you, I'll give you an example myself. I grew up uh, in a very, very, very tight-knit family and in the positive way. And my grandmother was a notorious cook. She never cooked small. She cooked big. And she cooked with not one, you know, she comes from the, came from the school that if two is good, 13 is better, OK? So when she would make anything, she'd load it with butter after frying it with lard, and it was so good, right? <laughs> but when you went over there, her, her, her routine was to load up your plate. You couldn't do this by yourself. You, you have to load up your plate. And she'd give it to you, and you ate that. And while you're eating it, you could feel yourself expanding and expanding. And then you lean back, and you say, uh, Bush, I'm done. Bush has Polish for grandma. And she'd say, what? After I cooked all day, after I did this, and she loads it up again. <laughs> and you start again, right? And it's like you pray to God, let me find another stomach, ASAP. And, and when I, I said to my mother, I said, when I, when I have my own place, I will never, ever do that to anybody. So I had a couple of friends over. And I, 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 uh, I'm having dinner with them, and, and uh, after, after we finish dinner, and I said, is that all you're going to eat? After I cooked, and I got up, and I said, wait a minute, I'll be right back. And I ran to the phone, and I called my mother, and I said, I'm possessed. She's in me. And I told my mother what I did, and my mother said, all right, let me ask you something. Did you actually put the food on their plate? And I said, no, no, I didn't do that. She said, oh, no, you're not possessed. She's just in your kitchen. Okay. <laughs> So when you ask yourself about these beliefs, you want to find out about beliefs. Think about connecting to negative beliefs you hold about others. Let me give you, how many of you have ever said to yourself or to others, well, you know, really, I don't really personally believe that, but I grew up that way. So you, what, what is so powerful about that is you recognize, look at the spiritual interference of that. What you're actually saying is, on my journey to consciousness, I'm not all that sure I'm interested in it because what it means is I have to take responsibility for the negative beliefs I have about others instead of going through my first chakra and out of my mouth comes, they did this to me, therefore I am not responsible. Instead of saying, you know what, I am responsible. There's something about that negativity that appeals to me. You know, you have to and you can't blame your family any anymore. Got it? On to the second chakra. This center of your body is one that we, is the control and power center in the physical world. Control and power. Physical power. It deals with sex, power, and money. Do we have any interest in those subjects? <laughs> All right. So this center of your body, this is also, I want you to know, the center uh, that is your center of weaponry. OK? So it's, your, it's literally your center of survival. OK? And I think it's so in, in uh, Credible that this is the part we've designed our weapons to go around. We just sort of instinctively knew that. This is the center, obviously, of one-to-one -one relationships. And what I mean by that is anything from personal, emotional, to the way you work with strangers, to the way you connect with people that you uh, work with professionally. It doesn't matter. This is your one-to-one -one center. And it, it's so intriguing. Now, pay attention to the way people uh, operate. When you meet somebody who you are nervous about in the power area, not in the self-esteem area, we'll get to that in a minute, but in the physical power area, somehow they either make you feel financially inadequate or they make you feel uh, like physically they can control the territory you're on, you're going to cover yourself like this. You will cover this. You'll stand there like this. You won't do this. You'll do this. It's absolutely intriguing. You will cover the part of your body almost unintent, no, totally unintentionally, that tells you where you are leaking power. So pay attention to that because your body language is not an accident. It's designed as a signal system, very, very much so. 
So essentially, this is a very powerful power. All chakras are powerful. But this one has a particular kind of power that I, it, my sense after all of these years is quite frankly that all illness starts below the waist. If you hold the position, and I I'm, I'm, want to point out here that I do not hold the position that all illness comes from negativity. I don't believe that at all. And I think it's time that we seriously reevaluate that whole concept because it's not true. Illness can be the consequence of a prayer, God give me guidance. And it opens up a whole new pathway in your life. It can, uh, illness can represent other um, processes that are going on deep within you. It's not only because you may not have liked your childhood or, or you were so traumatized by the end of a relationship. I mean, let's proportion appropriately how powerful uh, negativity is. But the areas of our body that tend to hold the most negativity are the first, second, and third, because what happens is, let's say you, you, you um, well, let's go on into how we negatively lose power in the second chakra. This may sound like I'm talking about an issue that none of you can relate to, so I'm gonna talk about the need to be in control Yes, I thought so. All right. When you need to control somebody, the technique, what automatically happens is you begin to discharge energy from your second chakra. And you literally begin to penetrate this system. Now, it's no accident that the nature of this penetration is exactly like sexual penetration. You are literally... Um, attempting to uh, control another person's energy field and usually the other person returns the compliment with either uh, an equal battle in which you have an adversarial relationship with someone or where you have the aggressor and the victim kind of dynamic going on. Either way, you're going to lose energy and the need to be con uh, in control is very territorial. Um, and, it, you know, have you ever seen um, the way animals mark their territory? It's by using, shall we say, the energy from this part of their body. They literally mark their territory. We have that instinct in us. But we mark our territory by the way we speak, by our attitude. We're attitude markers, okay? And, you know, you want, you want to te test how territorial uh, you are? Watch how you feel if you walk into your workplace and somebody's messed up your desk. <laughs> or somebody has moved your files. Now, I could tell you on a, shall we, say, shall we say, rational level, what's the matter with you? These papers weigh two ounces. This is just paper. It weighs two ounces. It's not paper to you. It's power. And it's power you've invested your circuits in. And that's all there's to it. And you lose a great deal of your sense of energy over that because if you really thought about this, when you have controlling relationships or the need to control uh, people you fear losing, as in an emotional relationship, or uh, where you are terrified that this person is going to change at a speed that doesn't include you or just doesn't need you as much, that you are literally waging war 100% of the time of each day of your life. I just want you to hold that image in mind, that no matter uh, who you are, no matter what you're doing, you could be vacuuming, you could be whatever it is, but you are waging war because this is the battle zone. And when you are thinking about another person, with whom you have a negative relationship. And have any of you ever felt any jealousy? <laughs> yeah. All right. This is the energy. We have uh, that kind of energy here. We have the energy of um, that you want to apply that kind of notion of jealousy, which is the hot, raging one, to what happens if your partner in relationship does this without your permission, looks to the right, looks to the left. 
That kind of controlling energy is so incredibly terrifying because you realize instantly you're losing power. But that's one of the hardest kinds of uh, energy to pull, to literally call back to you because it shoots so fast and you don't want to call it back because you really want to hold on to the territory of that other person. Uh, another uh, part of our energy that we lose so quickly from the second chakra is to addictions. Now, addictions come in many forms. They're not just physical. We have emotional addictions. We have what we call supportive addictions to our personality, to our spiritual practice. But they're really addictions. They, they can be, in their shadow side, a way of controlling others. I've walked into many a household where people will say, take off your shoes, speak silently at this hour, I'm in meditation, da, da, da. but you sense immediately this really isn't in support of their, of, of, of their spirituality. They're taking charge of the rules of the land. And you have to operate within those rules. I tend to say, excuse me, I'm out of here. Because that kind of energy makes me very uncomfortable. You know, but that's exactly what's going on. On the other hand, let's talk about the positive side of this. The positive side of the second chakra is that you can empower people with it. You know, living in this uh, planet, in a world where sexuality, money, um, relationships with other people mean a form of physical survival. It's very difficult to, to learn how to work with this energy on a generous basis. This is not the center of our body where we're, we're accustomed to being generous. It is more often that we need to borrow from others a little bit of this energy because we're running out, because it's such an expensive chakra to maintain. This is not a cheap chakra center, okay? This is, this is like your Neiman Marcus center, okay? <laughs> okay? And so when you are actually in a supportive relationship from the second chakra, you are capable of saying to another person, not pulling out money from your pocket and, and giving them 200 bucks or something, it's more like holding the position of support that says, you know what, I, I believe you're going to make it. And, but you are actually kicking prana into that belief and transferring it to them. You're not just saying empty words. You're actually taking a part of your prana that engages contact with their energy system so suddenly they feel an electric, an electric charge from the words you shared, whereas somebody else can say the same thing, and it goes in one ear and out the other, as they say. Those people with whom you have that kind of relationship, either on the giving end or the supporting end, in terms of how they work with the, their physical power, how they feel about themselves physically, uh, in terms of their sense of sexuality, in terms of learning to manage their control issues, and you're able to support them there, you engage a very uh, beautiful capacity of the heart, which is uh, the, the ability to merge that loving energy with the, of the heart with that very primal energy, that primal survival energy of the second chakra. And you mix that two together, and you have a very forceful electricity because you give someone a true sense of uh, it's more than faith in the universe. It is simultaneously faith in God and in the universe that's in us as God that you can handle what's happening to you, not in your emotional life, but in your physical life. It gives you physical strength. So when you're losing power from your second chakra, you want to ask yourself these questions. Do I need to control anybody? If so, how much? And identify who that person is. But the best way to identify it is not to say, and to say the person by name particularly, like I need to in control Tom or Mary or Sue or Billy. You're leaning over your, first, your second chakra, by the way. We got your vulnerable point. To, but rather that don't look, don't evaluate whether you're controlling the messenger in your life. See it symbolically. 
Because you ask yourself, am I controlling in personal relationships? Because what, what you begin to understand is whether this person was sitting opposite you or that person, you would be just as controlling. So it's not that particular person. It's rather, am I controlling in relationships in general? Or do I l allow others to control me? If so, why? Do I have any addictions? How much? And how much of my energy do I pour into addictions? How much do they, do they have control over me? Right. Addictions are an incredibly expensive energetic habit, never mind what they do to you physically. Okay. What about your financial, your relationship to finances? Ask yourself, does money have power over me? Can I be controlled by money? Can I be bought? Okay. You want, you gotta, you've got to ask yourself these questions because if you answer yes, and I'm sure nobody in this room will, but if you answer yes, what you, are, what you have to realize is that in terms of healing, at an unconscious level, and maybe more unconscious than you'll ever realize, you'll associate healing with something you can buy versus something you can actually, that you actually have to generate within yourself because you'll have a buy and sell mentality of power. So you really, and, and, and the other thing, I mean, you want to ask yourself, am I afraid to make money? Am I, and am, am I frightened of it? And here again, you're going to face a question of, of maturity because you want to ask yourself, am I, do I want to stay on an allowance on this planet or do I really want to manage myself at a more adult level and allow higher finances to come into my energy field? These are very powerful questions and you, and you have to dive deep sometimes and sometimes you don't. I can't not tell you how many times in doing a reading with someone I've picked up you know, as I, go, as I go into this energy, I've picked up uh, a belief that they've had connected to, if I just make an allowance, then I am permitted to be more irresponsible than other people. What do I mean by an allowance? Uh, and I don't mean literally 50 cents a week. I'm talking about, shall we say, a socially, uh, social income, a societal income that we would we could call an allowance because it, it allows you a very uh, survival, survival atmosphere in which to spend that money. You can't exactly flit over to Paris every weekend. But if, if you have that kind of relationship with money, it also says, I don't really have to be that responsible as an adult and I don't actually have to be that responsible for my social choices or in relationships. And it gives me permission to be more dependent. And I like that. It gives you permission to be more um, like a damsel in a castle. Okay? It's got that tone to it. All right? Or, or for men, it comes across as what you might think of as the puer eternus, the ability to remain the eternal boy. You know, it's really dangerous when the eternal boy meets the damsel. That's a bad combination, okay? So you want to ask yourself, how much control does money, what role does money play with you, as well as sexuality? Are you comfortable with your sexuality? Do you, and nobody is, so don't be, uh, don't be too quick to say yes, okay? But if you're not comfortable with it, what's the reason? Were you influenced by something that came from your childhood, from a relationship? Did someone once say something that made you feel very badly about or bad about your sexuality? If so, you know, what, how much energy are you giving to this? And I'll tell you something. Uh, negative or hurtful sexual, sexual memories are among the most difficult to detach from because they really do damage. So to pull that energy back from where it happened, from what relationship, that's an effort. And I, you know, I, I, I'm in a compassionate way, I'm going to say to you, you can't really do it in the instantly, but you can do it. You just have to be aware. It begins with figuring out how much of your energy is going in that direction to begin with. All right. Um, another energy you want to be conscious of in the second chakra is betrayal. 
You know, there is a reason why we develop the phrase, I've been stabbed in the back. And when you use that phrase, be very conscious of it. You'll only use it when you're referring to something that has to do with the second chakra. For example, if I, if I, if I was a little late for our lunch date, you would never, ever, ever say, Carolyn, you just stabbed me in the back. <laughs> you, you know what I mean? It's too, you're, you're smashing me with too much power in that phrase that the situation doesn't call. But let's imagine that you said to me, here, I'm going overseas. Will you manage my bank account? I said, oh, yeah. And you come back, and I said, you know, I can't help it. I invested all this in stock for you, and I played the, I played the horses, and I did that, and it's all gone. Now, that qualifies for, my God, did you stab me in the back? Because your finances, incidentally, live in your lower back. Your money is not, repeat, not in the bank. All right? <laughs> and so when we use feelings like you've been stabbed in the back, or expressions like you're stabbed in the back, you literally are referring to a survival power, i.e. sexuality, money, mostly money, that's been where the leak has been thrust into you by another. You've been lanced by a blade. And that your energy starts leaking out of there and you feel like an act of betrayal. And that's another form of wound, shall we say, that is tremendously difficult to heal. Third chakra. Again, I'm going to start by drawing the line over this, and we're going to get into your third chakra. This is your center of personal power. Now, I want to point out here that all of these powers, all of these chakras, are vibrating power, a quality of power, that makes you comfortable in your external world. These are all survival centers of power in your body. Every one of them. How you survive within a group or community, how you survive one to one, and then this one is how you work with yourself in survival power. So the numbers go from great to one on one to the self. So in, in your third chakra, you have your center of self esteem. You have your center, uh, it's your, the, the chakra that carries not only your, your center, your feeling about yourself internally, but also how you feel about your physical body. This is your center of confidence, okay? This is your center of um, honor. This is where your honor code is. Now, I'll tell you something about honor. It's one, it's one of those things that until I wrote Anatomy of the Spirit, I had absolutely no idea of the role that honor played in the maintenance of our health during the process of healing. None whatsoever. And then as I began to work from the position of honor, kind of um, becoming a w more and more aware of it in the people with whom I was working in, in either workshops or doing readings on, because every now and again I sneak readings into my workshops or whatever, I realized that people who truly had a sense of honor, which means they kept their word, they understood the significance of what it meant to um, hold on to a secret that another person has said, we, can, I, can I share a grief with you? Can I share a trauma with you? W will you honor my confidence? And they put it into their third chakra and said, it's safe with me. And what, what happens with that is you're literally taking some of your precious energy, your precious life force, and you're saying, here, give me that grief for a while. I'll put it in here because it doesn't cost me anything. I can hold it in my system while your system, think of it as an energetic ulcer, while your system repairs itself because this grief doesn't hold any power for me. I could hold it in my pocket for forever, and it just doesn't have power. Right? But if you turn around, and you can't, I mean, that's a sense of honor. You've got to understand that's a part of your honor. It also means the manner in which you um, conduct yourself and how you see others. I, I, it's, hard, it's difficult for me to say this, but I really do believe it, and I mean today. And that's that we've become rather a dishonorable culture 
in which the, we focused far more on the management of each other's dishonor than the expectation that we're dealing with an honorable person. We, you know, we show up at every one of our meetings armed with 17 lawyers. No matter who says what to us, we figure every possible meaning of what these words could, could not mean, and we write our laws accordingly so that we capture someone within the parameters of vocabulary witnessed by a lawyer. I mean, we, have a, we don't even trust that our leaders have any honor. We live in a very challenging time when it comes to this part of our lives. And honor and your personal honor code live here. And I want to point something else out. Energy not only comes in, it comes in and then it rotates right back up because you connect your energy to the ground, you make your contribution to the physical earth, and then you pull in the uh, returns on your investments. Okay? Honor lies right in the third chakra, right before you enter into your energetic system of your heart, your will, and your mind. It's as if you need some sense of integrity, some sense of endurance, to be able, the, the capacity spiritually to say to the gods, to God, whatever you want to call the source, if you want me to do something for you, I have, and say to God with your honor code, I have the strength, I can endure. What do you want me to carry? Because this is your center of endurance, personal strength, personal respect of yourself. I mean, can you give your word to yourself and keep it, never mind someone else? Can you say to yourself, that's it, I've had enough of you, you are exercising starting tomorrow, and then the next morning you get up like this, and you're lying down, and you say that you got the thought, exercise, it drops to your will, which means you've got to choose it or not, and your will says, uh -uh, I'm sleeping, and it drops to your heart, and your heart says, well, maybe I'll put my energy in it or not. You can't control it, and it drops to your, your third chakra, and your third chakra says, you excuse me. But you've just broken your word to me again. And I just want to point that out. And that when you do this, you don't understand. You really develop a very powerless relationship with yourself. And if you have that, how in the world can you have an empowered relationship with somebody else? Do you really think it's possible? I don't. Not at all. And you'll live in the assumption that every single person is going to be, has been, or is in the present moment dishonorable to you. You'll assume it. Okay? Now, part of the wonderful thing about this third chakra is that it makes you, either in this life or another life, because of how it can absolutely uh, cause trouble in your internal zone, it you have to grow to a point to settle your, ch your third chakra in, to make it, to go through the process of empowerment. You've got to learn what it means to maintain strong personal boundaries. Now that's a very difficult stage in personal development. Why? Because you start by learning tribal boundaries long before you get to the point of personal boundaries. You start to learn the boundaries of the house long before you learn what it means to have the boundaries of your room, right? And it's in when, as you change those boundaries from physical space to personal space, you're going through a huge transition, a huge transition, especially if you come from a tribal situation where the tribe's notion of, pers of boundaries remains physical and you've evolved to emotional, psychological. You're speaking two different languages. But when you have poor personal boundaries, you're going to fall into this pattern. You'll start immediately giving your energy over to someone else because you need their approval. Okay? Because that's what matters to you is their approval, not how much you approve yourself of yourself, but whether they said something nice to you that day. Now, think about that. I just want to put this in proportion. I'm not telling you to change. I just want to give you a proportion, 
no attitude here, a proportional view of how preposterous this is. Now imagine, you get up in the morning, you have your whole life in front of you that day. All of your creative energy, everybody you know, anything you want to do with yourself, and you dress for this one person whose approval you want. You form your language for this one person whose approval you want. You figure out your whole life's schedule for this one person. Now, do you really think it's worth it? I just want to ask you. Just good. But do you do it? Go like this now. Go like this. Okay. So, but this is your center for approval. This is also the, the center, of course, because it's personal boundaries. And if you don't have strong personal boundaries, by just as a consequence of that, you are going to become manipulative. You have no other choice. If you can't go in through the front door, you're going to go in through the back door. Right? You'll develop private agendas with people, and this is how that's going to work. This is speaking private agenda fluently. You'll say to someone, you'll say to someone, can I do something for you? Or I've done this just for you. And that person will be grateful, but the way you are interpreting it is, okay, got a hook in their mouth. Okay, this is the first stage. They're going to need me. I'm going to have to, I'll do this for them more and more. It'll bring out the rescuer in you. It'll bring out that kind of manipulative attitude. One person did something for me one time. She, I was teaching a workshop somewhere, and she um, brought me my lunch the next day. I didn't ask her to do it, but it, it really, initially, I thought it was a very thoughtful gesture. And she, she must have spent hours decorating this bag it came in. You know, it had flowers on there, and uh, like there was, uh, what do you call those, sticker, rubber, um, butterflies, all kinds of things, it had a bow. And uh, she gave, she delivered this lunch, but her private agenda was that I would ask her to join me for lunch, okay? And that um, during lunch, I suspected out would come the request, would you mind doing a reading on me, okay? Now, here's the truth about working with me. I am far more comfortable with giving me a direct hit. Carolyn, will you or won't you? But don't, you know, I, I'm very uncomfortable. But as it turned out, I already really did have plans for lunch. So I said, you know, I'd love to join you, but I can't. I, I've got a commitment here. And uh, instantly, the way she felt about me went from high to crashing. I got, I received a six or seven page letter from this person telling me what a rude and arrogant person I was, what a disappointment I was to her, and how I'm not living up to anything. I'm to, all because I didn't have lunch with her. And had she simply said, Carolyn, I'd like a reading, drop the whole lunch thing, well, I would have said yes. And this would have never happened. But this is what, and you, you understand that when you operate from the realm of private agenda, you will absolutely believe that you are seeing reality as it is that it's your reality and only you can see things as they really are. You, if I walked up to you and said, why are you interpreting that person's attitude today as though it were directed toward you? This, this, me, this person's anger has nothing to, to do with you today. You are simply seeing it that way. But if your third chakra is heading in this direction, you're leaking all of this energy into this perception and into that person's energy field. And you know what happens? When you are actually that connected to another person through the energy you pour out of your third chakra into them, into him or her, shall we say, what happens is that even if peop of these people that you're leaking energy to are not in the same room as you, I mean, they could be on the other side of the planet. It, the dis distance matters not to leakage. Leakage does not speak time, space, or distance, okay? Get the rule straight. So here you are writing something, having, you know, doing anything you want with yourself. And all of a sudden, you feel this sort of jolt to your stomach. You feel a nervous stomach starting, right? And you'll automatically do this because it's a physical chakra. You'll think you'll look for a physical reason as to why that's happening. And someone might say to you, why are you so nervous today? Or why are you, why are you so uppity, jittery? And you'll think, I don't know, maybe I had too much caffeine, the standard excuse. But the fact is, you, you may be receiving energy from somebody who's trying to get their hooks into you. 
or you may be leaking energy to that person or to a whole series of people and not even realize it. Because the, these, the dialogue that goes on from each of our chakras is a continual dialogue. One to one, two to two, it's, it's just going on all the time. There's a lot to do with uh, the maintenance, and we lose power here so rapidly. Um, spiritual development has so much to do with learning how to manage the self-esteem in this part of our body and our sense of self-respect and personal dignity. It is such a difficult challenge. All right. So let's go on to the po positive side of this, our wonderful third chakra. I'm talking in the third chakra, the good point, the good power, the positive energy that generates from this part of our body, this area, is that we truly do have a sense of self-respect, not arrogance. Arrogance is not what I'm talking I'm talking about self-respect, where we actually know what it is to um, feel good about the way we are either publicly or privately. We take pride in our work. We know what it is. Not pride so other people applaud what we do, but because we recognize I'm breathing my energy into this, this, this uh, act of creation. Whether you're baking something or creating, uh, painting a ceiling in the Sistine Chapel, it doesn't matter. You are doing it from the recognition that I am absolutely conscious that my energy is flowing into this action and that it is crucial for me to respect the energy with which I do this. I have frequently looked at the beautiful art and architecture from Europe, as I'm sure you know many people have. You realize it has often taken people 20, 25 years to build one building, sometimes 30. And sure, of course, we can you know, credit the difference in technology. Of course, there's a lot to be said about that. But I also believe that the craftsmen who worked in these years of working with tools and the delicacy of working with their hands, and some, there are some uh, certain professions, jewelry making, of course, that maintain that, but they had a very different sense of pride in how they did things. That level of personal pride and um, self-respect came from how well they created that which they gave to others. They're proud of their skills. This is also a level where it allows you to be able to deal with other people without fear that they're going to gut you in some way. That, and, and it gives you the ability to stand up to someone who might pass a negative remark in your direction. And you're able to detach from the power of that negativity. And so that's just that person's opin opinion. I am not going to allow that energy to enter into my energy system. You are strong enough to protect your own boundaries. Or if you said to another person, I've got this idea, what do you think? And the person is envious of your creativity and says, I, I'd never even consider doing that. You're strong enough to say, okay, that's your opinion, but uh, I'll take someone else's or I'll decide this on my own, where you're not seduced by the power of another person's consciousness. It is so difficult to live this way. And the other thing you want to remember is that your third chakra is your center of survival intuition. This is your center. Everybody's born with intuition, this nonsense that it's a gift. Drop that. That is a, that, that's a uh, bad rumor. Intuition is not a gift. It's what you're born with. You've got a survival skill. Every single person knows what it's like to get a hunch to feel like, I don't know, this, is, this doesn't feel right to me. What do you think that is if not intuition? People think intuition is this, the capacity to, to see the future before you make a decision so you can know for a fact that you will not lose money and there'll be romance waiting for you on the other end. <laughs> Excuse me, that's not intuition, that's, that's, that's fantasy. All right? Real intuition is this, God, something's wrong here. I feel like something's wrong here. I feel like uh, every single time I walk into this job, I feel worse and worse and worse. Any of you ever had that feeling? <laughs> what do you think that is? That's your intuition saying, get out of here. All right? 
you don't, intuition is not vision, it's this. Now, if you have low self-esteem, you'll never follow your intuition without or through a crisis. You will always require a crisis before you act on it because you haven't got enough self-respect or self-esteem to actually listen to the energy as it's being presented to you in the energetic way, what I call the wisdom path. So you end up taking the woe path. Okay? You're always offered the next step in your life in the energetic way by feeling like, this. I don't fit in this world anymore. I don't fit in this relationship anymore. I don't fit wherever. Fill in the blank. But if you don't have enough self-esteem, you won't have the courage to say, I've got to pack my bags and get out of here. You'll sit around oming and eyeing and hope running to one psychic after another. Anybody who'll tell you what to do next. So if it doesn't work, you'll blame them. Instead of saying, I'm reading this sequel, I've got the guts to do this. These are what these signals are telling me. And then you move on to your next level or the next place in your life. And you realize that's intuitive guidance. That's what it is. It's not about visions. It's about following the uncomfortable hits that you get in this part of your body. Now, these are the questions you want to you ask yourself to figure out if you're losing any power from your third chakra. Let's begin with, if you tell yourself you're not losing power from here, you're lying. All right, now, <coughs> ask yourself, do you feel good about your own sense of honor? Do you have an honor code? Do you keep your word? Do you respect yourself in this capacity? Do you need anybody else's approval? Or, here's the other way to, to, to present that question. Do you know anybody who needs your approval, who would be helped a great deal if you looked at them and said, if you looked at him or her and said, I really think you're a wonderful person, you can do this on your own. And do you consciously withhold that approval? as a way of not strengthening somebody else. You want to ask yourself both questions. You simply do not want to ask self-evaluative questions from the victim's point of view of what have people done to me. You also want to take a look at what have you done to others because you can lose an equal amount of energy by your negative actions to somebody else. It's, if you just evaluate it from what have others done for me, you're just walking on one foot. All right, you've got to do it both ways. You've got to say, am, am I criticizing others? Am I a critical person? Uh, do I operate from that point of view? Do I deliberately not respect another person's boundaries? Because I thrive on the power of that. Do I break my word or do I keep my word? You want to ask yourself these questions from both point of view. And then when you ask these questions, don't go down them like you read a menu. Go down it with a sense of, okay, pay attention. If a question makes yours, you nervous, makes you uncomfortable, or if you respond too soon, that's not me. Remember Shakespeare, sir, thou doth protest too much. You better go back in there again. It's, it's, uh, you want to look at this. Your third chakra is, is your center, too, uh, I want to add, of responsibility of your capacity to take responsibility for yourself. And, and you want to notice that because it's in the physical third chakra, the ability to take responsibility, that's a lot of abilities, isn't it? The capacity to take responsibility for yourself physically, for your physical life, comes before the journey above your waist, which is to take responsibility of your energetic life. If you can't manage yourself in the physical, do you honestly think you're going to manage yourself well in the, in the energetic world, in the consciousness world? Do you would you give millions of dollars to someone who can't get over a drug addiction? Would you do that? Or would you be more inclined to wait until that person matured, kicked the drug habit, 
kicked the uh, feeling of, of a low self-esteem, actually felt good, had a sense of personal dignity, knew what it was to live by an honor code. Now, you'd feel totally different giving that person a lot of power. It's the same thing with us. Okay, so this is our area where you want to ask yourself about your sense of responsibility. These are the questions you want to work with. What I tell people is because it's so hard to kind of enter into the meditative state, start from your first chakra and work your way up. Follow the natural sequence of your energy instead of jumping here and deciding, mm, I'm going to just pull it. It won't go that way. It'll never listen to you. Instead, you start with imaging what your first chakra would tell you, which is your tribe, your groundedness, about how pleasant your life would be if you weren't involved in the memory of that situation. And so you begin to visualize, not unplugging from it, but the kind of life you want right now. Just start then. Just, it doesn't even have anything to do with that injury, wound, memory, relationship. Just what you want today. And then, then work your way up to the second chakra, which is, what kind of relationships do I want today? How do I want to interact with people? How do I want to make my life different than the way it was? And don't go backwards. Don't even think about, don't do this within the context of that memory being in the center of it. All right? And then do it with your third chakra, which is, how would I feel? How do I really want to feel about myself? And start building up this uh, stronger image of yourself. Now here again, that's not a small task because the uh, development of self-esteem or uh, healthy relationships is very difficult. So you're only starting with creating a road map. In the meantime, what you do is you forbid yourself to discuss with anybody your past. You can't do it. I mean, this is what you can discuss, what you had for lunch, you, 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 you can discuss safe past, but you cannot discuss wounded. You drop the wound language, all right? And uh, that in itself is tremendously healing because you, what you are actually doing more than anything else is you're breaking your uh, word habit far more than withdrawing from the wound, believe it or not. You're breaking your word habit because you get up and unconsciously plug in the same uh, audio tape. Um, I'll never forgive that person for what he did to me or she did. Nee, 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 nee. It goes on and on. So if you, if you consciously change your vocabulary and you, and you meet somebody and they say, how are you? And you don't say, well, it's my childhood again. It's just been having dinner with me. And instead say, you know, I'm really fine. It's okay today. I'm, uh, I put my shoes on the right feet. You, you'd be surprised the healing power these simple things are because again, in terms of the divine paradox, it's the simple things that have the power. It's the mustard seed that moves your mountain. Nobody will make any effort by moving the mountain. That's how you unplug. You start doing things like this that look like you're not unplugging, but they really are. And then by the time you get to your mind, if you will, and you look backwards, you can't even see the person. One of the most wonderful things that ever happened to me was when I was 20 years old and uh, I was in a big trauma. I think it was because I broke a pencil. You know how big traumas are when you're 20. But I really was traumatized about something in college. And uh, I had a dream, and I, I, it was probably more than a dream. But all of a sudden, I found myself 20 years in the future. And I was 40 years old. I'd give my right arm to be 40 now. But anyways, I was 40 years old. And there was a, a teacher, a guide with me, who said, all right, now look back at what's upsetting you. And I couldn't even see it. I said, well, I, I don't remember what it was. He said, all right, now, with that attitude, go back there and deal with it. And I, I cannot tell you how liberating that experience was. I've used it ever since. Whenever I am that upset about something, I literally will leave the time zone. So instead of going backwards, I go this way. And I oftentimes tell people that another wonderful way of unplugging is to go visualize tomorrow and see if they really want to see that person again next week.